you. Um, good morning. I'm so happy to be here after so many years apart because we haven't had a WordCamp in a while since pre-COVID. So this is so nice to be here. Um, welcome, everybody, especially those who came from far away and definitely those newbies. Um, we are going to be talking about all the fun stuff. Uh, generative AI overview, using chat GPT for SEO content tasks. What does Google say about all this? Making sure everybody is staying in compliance. And then definitely, hopefully, having a good Q&A session and hearing some ideas. This is me. Um, what I just wanted to say was that I attended my first WordCamp in 2009. I was a brand new solo freelance consultant. I had no idea what I was doing. My name tag said blogspot, jennymun.com dash blogspot. I mean, I'm sorry, period blogspot, I think, .com or something. And so I went here. It was called the Genius Bar until WordCamp got into a little bit of trouble because that's what Apple calls it. So then they had to change it to the Happiness Bar. I can't tell you guys how much I owe those technical guys who sat in there listening to my questions. I would literally carry my computer and I would plunk it down, like, please help me create my, my, um, my WordPress website. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm not technical. I'm a nerdy writer. And I absolutely encourage anybody who has questions about your WordPress website to go to the happiness bar. They, they are the nicest guys and girls, women too, in the whole world. Um, and the WordPress community is amazing. I definitely credit it with how I got my, not only start as a freelancer and consultant, but how I built my business as well because of the amazing people here in this community. Um, I spoke the very first time in 2012 thanks to the encouragement of friends like Brandy and here. So again, our peers are in this room and um, referrals and just there's so many ripple effects from a WordCamp. So welcome, you guys are an amazing company. Um, this really is an amazing community. So I'm so happy to be back. I got chills walking in this morning. So <laughs> I know, I know. Um, so I've worked if with like a micro one person business all the way to Fortune 100 businesses and every industry in between. I do work in education right now. Um, but uh, no question is dumb and especially related to SEO content in any situation. So let's go ahead and get started. When you hear AI, especially, you know, there's AI, um, I think there's AI talks on AI and project management, there's AI in social media, AI has to do with lots of topics. When it comes to SEO, there's two things that come to mind. The first is when AI integrates into search engines. And that is going to be coming down the line in a couple months, right? So right now we go to a separate tool, like we have to go to ChatGPT or we have to go to Bard. Soon those will be integrated fully into Google and we're getting ready for that. So when it's integrated and when there's universal adoption, things are going to change with how users go to Google, how they type things in, how they discover businesses and websites. And so we are all holding our breath for a little bit. The second is, SEO content task, what I call implementation, right? Helping us do our jobs when it comes to content creation, productivity, efficiency, automation, all those things. Tools like ChatGPT and Bard and Claude, those are just um, for copy, right? Generative AI, there's, there's image AI, there's so many AI tools, but this is for content and text. And that's what we're going to be talking about today because I only have so much time. I would love to go into all the topics, but I wanted to keep it super focused for you guys. And I figured that was what everybody is probably dealing with, right? Does everybody in here write content in some aspect? Okay, good. Who uses um, one of these tools on a regular basis? Okay, most people. Okay, good, good. Uh, ChatGPT, I feel like, was, of course, almost a year ago now, one of the very first to roll it out for free for people, right? It like took the world by storm for sure. Um, things definitely changed um, and they are con continuing to. So I love ChatGPT. I use the free version for a long time. I now pay the $20 a month because I wanna see, is it really different? And I do like to upload spreadsheets and Excel and look at some of the data and some of the plugins they have. But for writing purposes, I think the free version is fine too. I'm just exploring using it for some of the more advanced data analysis. Bard, um, 
I really like Bard too. And for a while, I, would, I committed to using ChatGPT every day since the beginning of the year. And then I would say, well, I'm going to use, I'm going to go to Google because I would Google things. And then I'm going to Google that same search in ChatGPT. And then I'm going to do that same search in Bard to really understand, well, how are they different? Bard is owned by Google. So of course, that's how they came to the table when ChatGPT came out. And they've been pushing it hard. I do really like Bard. And I use both of them. Bard, you can upload images. In free chat GPT, you can't upload anything, right? It's just straight up text. And so it is kind of fun to play around with that. Then I learned about Claude several months ago. Claude is just another version just like this. It's free. What's interesting about them is you can upload a PDF or a CSV and have it analyzed. And so that gives us even more functionality. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But when I talk about AI tools, I tend to say chat GPT, but that kind of represents all of these, just depending on what you use. Kind of like how I, when I talk about SEO, I use Google, but of course there's Bing and other search engines as well. So we're gonna mostly talk about ChatGPT because I do think that's the more universally used tool. Uh, but again, all of these work. I really enjoy all of them. Um, I go back and forth. Schema used to be better when I would produce like some structured markup for SEO and BARD. That was my favorite, and then I would go to ChatGPT. So they keep changing, right? Functionality keeps changing, everything. They're all amazing, they're all fun. So I don't think I have to convince anybody why ChatGPT is a good thing. Um, I started out as a copywriter, and I was really nervous for my copywriting colleagues um, that jobs were going to be displaced, but the more I used, and SEO is gonna be displaced. I really truly thought like this might be the end of SEO. Um, that is not the case for either copywriters or um, SEOs, but what I really love the tool is it makes me so much more efficient. I truly do think that these tools make me a better professional and a better service provider for my clients. And all the studies out there corroborate that. So there's two. The first is from these um, economists with MIT. They found ChatGPT can substantially boost productivity. Uh, what they found was those who used it had 40% faster output while producing 18% higher quality. And again, what they found was tools like ChatGPT augment versus replace professionals, right? They give us a boost. Another study by um, very high level Harvard and all of the smart schools out there said participants who used AI, AI tools completed tasks 25% faster and also produced 40% higher quality results than those who didn't. And that is my finding as well. I think it just makes me faster and it makes me better. It doesn't replace me, but it just gives me a next step up and helps me get my things done faster at, I do feel like, a higher level. So other people found that. Does anybody not like these tools? I'm pulling out like my David here. Like, is anybody? I, I, I back you up on that. Okay. I use, uh, uh, oh, right. And me too. Oh gosh, absolutely. I get emails out the door faster. Is anybody, Grammarly helps. Yeah, 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 I love Grammarly. That's like a tool where every, every time my annual subscription comes up, I'm like, heck yes, yeah, done. Love Grammarly, and that's an AI tool, right? Um, so I just think this makes me a better professional. It doesn't replace us, thank goodness, yet. So as much as I love these tools, of course I can't talk about this without some obligatory caveats and notes and warnings. Privacy concerns. Do not upload anything to these tools that you do not have permission to share. So I wanted to upload a CSV of um, lead gen, client lead gen form. So when someone would fill out a, um, a lead gen form for one of my education clients, I wanted to upload that from the last several years to see what was the common theme that people wrote in the comments about. But I had to go to my client first and say, hey, can I upload this, this is your content, is there anything private? I had to strip out the names. I had to do a little work before I was able to upload it to make sure that we maintain privacy. So make sure you don't upload anything sensitive because these tools have said that, that it could be out there, right? So be careful. Hallucinating and inaccurate. So that still happens. Um, these tools, I always say like, they, they are very confident in their responses. It will generate a response that it is very confident in, even though it is blatantly incorrect. You have to know enough about your topic to know, okay, that is not even close to being accurate. And if you're not sure, you have to go verify it. So it's going to come up with something. That tool is 
rarely going to say, sorry, I got nothing. It's going to come up with something, right? So you have to know enough to say no and move on or to fix your response or to go validate it. Biases, of course, AI models can and do unintentionally perpetuate biases based on the data it was fed. Opinions and facts are ever evolving. And if you dabble in SEO at all, you know, just never say never, right? Never say never. Things change all the time. Years ago, I used to say the, the worst keyword you could ever try to rank for was weight loss. Do not try to rank for that or personal injury attorney. But lo and behold, years ago, when Google started uh, hyper-localizing search results, the little weight loss clinic down the road from me that had like a really rinky-dinky site outranked um, really national um, weight watchers, right? Because Google was localizing search results. So I'm like, okay, well now you can go after terms like that. Um, I used to say, gosh, what was it? That you can't upload, you can't have one of these tools crawl a website link. I saw it for a little while and then it disappeared. So right, these tools are ever changing and evolving. So, you know, we're just gonna keep an eye on things and our opinions will evolve as these do as well. And then these tools aren't supervised, right? They're out there in the wild. Again, it's up to us as good stewards of our profession and our clients and the marketing and ethics to make sure we're using them appropriately. Uh, because again, these tools are gonna spit out something whether it's good or not. Caveats and limitations, a couple more. Still right now, ChatGPT does not crawl URLs. So if you want it to evaluate copy or content or an article, you have to copy and paste that into the chat window. And because there's a character limit, you might have to do a couple different um, windows for it to go and say, here's part one, here's part two, here's part three. There's free tools that can help break it up. But I, every time I test it, I try to put in a URL because I'm always trying to put in competitor URLs and having it evaluate competitor copy. It says, sorry, we do not have the capability to crawl this URL yet. We cannot go into a website yet. So just keep that in mind. If you want to evaluate copy, you actually have to copy and paste it in from a website. ChatGPT does not have access to search volume and other metrics the way a true keyword research tool would. Now I've asked it multiple times, what is the keyword search volume per month for these keywords? And it gives me data, but when I've actually verified it, it's wildly inaccurate. So again, here's where the tool is very confident in saying, oh, this keyword has 320 searches per month. It doesn't, you know, so, because I verified it with all of my keyword research tools. So it's gonna produce something, but right now it cannot pull keyword data. It'll tell you, it'll tell you it can, it'll make you believe it, but it cannot. Confident but wrong. Again, very confident in its answers, even though they can be wrong. You have to know enough to verify. Think of ChatGPT as what I say a virtual assistant. Again, we're ultimately responsible for the output, right? And what we do with that output. Oh, don't go down the rabbit hole. This is one of my favorite things. It was really fun to do like write me a rhyme in the in the style of Dr. Seuss about where camp Atlanta, right? Like I think we all did that back then. We played around with these tools and we were all like our minds were blown by what it could do. But now that we've gotten into it, again, if you're using it for business purposes, do not go down the rabbit hole. Go in, do what you got to do, and then get back out into your, your normal tasks. Um, Experts report there is an algorithm watermark that can tell when content is being written by AI. You know, schools all say that. All my kids' schools are like, we know if you're writing your essay and using ChatGPT to do it, kids, right? They've got a tool that can test it. Um, so again, not that that's bad or anything. Uh, we'll talk about what Google says, but just be mindful that it can possibly be tracked. Again, it's totally fine, but just keep that in mind. Okay, more limitations. This content that ChatGPT and Bard and Claude generate for you, I say is duplicative and generic, right from the get-go. It can pass plagiarism checks because what I wanted to say was, is this truly unique copy? I just asked it to write me a product description on something. Is it copying and pasting it from another website or is it actually unique? Because I said, write me unique copy. That's you know about 400 words on this topic and it wrote something really beautiful. When I went to a plagiarism checker, it passed. It said, this is unique copy. I was really impressed. <sighs> but when I went to then go and I used, I kind of typed in some of the phrases. So here's, here's my um, example. I asked it to write a product description on socks, right? And it came back with this really nice product description with this beautiful like 
these socks are like a warm hug for your feet. They're so cozy and comfy. And I was like, oh, I love that. I never in a million years would have thought about socks being a warm hug. I was very impressed with that analogy until I took it to Google to see if it was stealing that phrase from another website. And sure enough, multiple other websites were also using that same phrase. So again, it's not necessarily bad, but it kind of deflated my bubble a little bit like, oh, okay, it's not producing. So I'm like, an AI tool can't actually try on the socks and tell me what it thinks, right? So multiple other websites were using it. I just, you know, don't be fooled necessarily think that it's coming up with all this amazing, unique stuff because it's probably not necessarily. Yeah. So not necessarily because I just took a phrase when I, you know, put the whole 400 words in. It wasn't like it said this came exactly from these other websites because it's stitched together, right? It kind of stitches together this copy to be unique. But I just didn't want to, I don't want you guys to fool yourselves thinking it's 100% unique because it's just not necessarily. Again, I don't think the average person who's in the market to buy socks is going to be like, hey, I saw that phrase on this other website necessarily. Just don't fool yourself into thinking you're getting away with just like amazing insights because it's probably somewhere else. So that's all. I just burst my bubble a little bit. I just want everybody to know that, yeah, it is what it is. Um, so I've seen that a couple times. But even though it's got those limitations, I still think it's pretty good. So let's talk about some of the ways that I use this tool. Um, I was talking with some everybody, a couple people earlier about how I like had double the amount of slides, but when I saw my time frame, I was like, oh, I gotta cut back. Like I have so many ideas, and I know you guys do too, about how to use ChatGPT in your daily tasks, but again, we only have so much time here, so I kind of kept it to a couple that I use it for very regularly. So when it comes to SEO content, building out keywords, creating the on-page elements, on-page optimization, and then improving content. So that's kind of the three areas I'm gonna to stick to for these uh, purposes. So building out SEO keywords. Even though I told you it doesn't have accurate keyword volume, I use this all the time as a starting point, right? When it comes to helping clients um, or peers or colleagues come up with new keywords, I'm always always start out with, well, what do you think your target market is searching on to describe your products and services, right? It's always like, how do we get into our target market's head? What do they call it? What are the words they use? And I am not my client's target market, right? Often we as content creators or marketers are not the person we're trying to attract, right? And so you have to step out of your own shoes. This is SEO 101. And you have to step into the shoes of your searcher and what are they calling what they think your products or services are or their pain points or their needs. And so going to a tool like ChatGPT and saying, hey, help me come up with some keywords, what this market would search on on this topic, it's great at giving you a starting point of what we call seed keywords. Um, so keyword brainstorming and topic ideation, generating modifiers within a topic. So say you have a website. I have this here on pickleball. I do not play pickleball yet. I aspire to someday. I'm going to do it. I think I'm going to be really good at it because I can like, you know, have a drink in your hand, right? And like one hand in. I think I could rock that, but I haven't learned yet. But so I know nothing about pick, uh, pickleball. Yeah, I was going to say paddleball, pickleball. Um, so if I was helping though a client work on this, I would say, okay, help me come up with some keywords around pickleball. And so chat GPT, um, on pickleball paddles, right? Because here's the pickleball, which is the main topic. Then you niche it down because you have multiple categories, right? Pickleball paddles for large hands, for small hands, for extra large hands, for narrow hands, um, for junior, for youth. I didn't even know that that was a thing, like that you had to consider, right? That there might be different, you might need to pick out a different paddle for different, again, things that I never would have even thought of. Chad GPT thought of it for me and help me come up with some modifiers and know which direction to go to and expand um, the SEO capabilities, right? So not just having a pickleball paddles page, well maybe we need a couple pages that go into the specifics of what you need if you're youth, if you have oversized hands, if you have like tiny little hands like me, I don't know. So again, it just kind of helps you along to get to your research and then get to a tool faster. And then categorizing by search intent. Is anybody newish with SEO, like newer? Okay, um, well, one of the things I'm always trying to explain is 
there's multiple different categories of keywords you have to go after. There's transactional, when someone is ready to buy something, and there's informational, when they're just trying to do research and arm themselves with research, and you have to know what are keywords that indicate when someone is ready to buy or they're ready to fill out a lead gen form, or they're just doing their research, right? You should know both categories. And that's very confusing for people. Like I usually get like blank stares um, of like, what the heck does that even mean? But guess what? Now you can go to a tool like ChatGPT or Bard or Claude or say, here are, um, here's a topic on pickleball. Help me come up with keywords and create a table on transactional keywords versus informational keywords. What are keywords when people are looking to buy or convert or do something versus they're just initially at the top of the funnel doing research. And it really helps you wrap your mind around that. So I'm always telling people, start here, then go to a keyword tool to, again, expand and get more traffic and more awareness and more visibility, which is what SEO does. Identifying gaps. So another thing that I like to do also, again, a lot of this is kind of next level um, SEO when you're saying, okay, I'm ranking pretty well for this group of keywords, but I know there's keywords that I'm missing. Often you have to go to a paid tool, like David said, SEMrush, he's not a fan of. <laughs> it's 129 a month. It is not very affordable um, for many people, right? So Usually they have a tool where you can put up a competitor website and you can put up your website and you can say, well, what keywords do they have that we do not have yet? Or you can take, you can go to your Google search console, which is free. You can upload your keywords in a CSV and you can say, I want to rank for all the keywords on this topic. Here are the keywords I do have. What keywords are missing or where are gaps or where are more opportunities? And I think it did a pretty good job. So I, one of my clients is the sweetest little pecan farm in Albany, Georgia. And we want to rank for all things pecans. And I've been working with them for years. So we really have covered our ground at this point. So to get to the next level, I said, well, what are keywords? I, I uploaded our Google um, search console data, first got permission to do so. Um, and it said, here are keywords you're not yet ranking for that we think maybe you should start with. And so again, they had some great, not all of these were great ideas. Some of these were irrelevant. Again, that's where you have to know what's irrelevant to your business or not. But some of these were really good ideas. Um, and so I thought that was a great usage of this, right? Because we're using these tools to get to the next level and increase our reach. Okay, the next one, the second one I use this for all the time is creating on-page SEO elements. So this is another SEO 101 basics. When you have your keywords, you actually have to work them into the page, right? You don't rank for SEO. You don't, you don't start to get to the top of Google by osmosis. You actually have to take your keywords and put them in your page. Some of the keywords and the keyword phrases in the SEO goes in the front end where you can see it. Some of them go into the back end, which is why WordPress is so wonderful because it makes it so easy and you don't have to be technical to put the title tag in the field and add a meta description and do some of those behind the scenes things that happen in the back end. So I really like this flow that I got from one of my copywriting mentors years ago. When you have a keyword, generally it goes in the title tag, you put it in the meta description, headline, body copy, into subheads, and you kind of like work it through anchor text, which is the, um, the words you use that link into a page or out of a page. And then always you have a call to action because I can't think of a single instance when you want someone to get to the end of a page of something you've written and not tell them what to do next. My copywriting mentor always said, if someone's actually taking the time to read your copy and you don't tell them what to do next, that's rude, right? And I always love that. I'm like, yes, go check out this other thing. Read this case study that we have. Um, I'm trying to say, it's not most of us are in here for business purposes, but I need to help. I only have a job if I can help clients grow their business and get more leads and make money. So I can't think of a single instance why you wouldn't want to tell someone what to do next. Follow us on social media. Sign up for our newsletter. Check out this second blog post. Again, there should be always something, right? So um, this, I actually use ChatGPT. It helped me come up with calls to action on what someone should do next. Like again, something so silly, it has come up with some really good ideas that I wouldn't necessarily have thought of automatically. And that's why I think that these tools are really helping me as a professional get to the next level because I always say it's things that I wouldn't have thought of that I see are great ideas. So title tag, again, um, for those of you who may not know what a title tag is, like that's SEO 101, the most important place you put, I tend to say keyword, I usually mean keyword phrase. Um, 
I have ChatGPT or these tools come up with title tags for me and meta descriptions. I say, here's my keyword, here's what the page is about, or I'll copy and paste in the page. I'll say, write me a title tag and a meta description within the character counts. And it does a really good job of getting me started. Um, so I like that. It helps giving me more topic or heading ideas. Give me subhead ideas. If I'm writing an article on pickleball paddles, um, help me come up with this outline and what are subheads that I should be including, what are topics. Uh, I also say, what are some image ideas? I'm always asking for image ideas. Otherwise, I'm gonna be going to a website, um, Pixabay or Pexel or another one, some of the paid ones and like looking through. If I can get a starter and get some ideas on what might be a great image, then that'll help me get there faster so I'm not just searching on image banks all day long. Um, and then again, yep, call to action ideas. So the SEO layer, I think, helps me get there faster and get it done faster. The next area is improving content, or what I like to say is beefing up your page. So one of the areas that um, people who want better SEO can get is they have what's called thin content or just pages that have like a short little paragraph. It's just not enough to get you to the top of Google when you just have a small little paragraph. Not every page needs to be a thousand words long, but if you're trying to improve specific pages, you might want to make your content more comprehensive. And so there was a study done by Search Pilot where they took a client's website page, they had GPT improve the content and make it more comprehensive. Um, and that resulted in a 13% traffic increase. So one of the prompts you could use is how can I improve this page, make it more comprehensive, and demonstrate our expertise in this specific topic. You copy and paste in what you have, and it'll, again, provide you with copy. That is generally pretty good. It will need to be edited and worked on and massaged, but it does a good job. And this definitely did show an increase in search results. I think these tools are amazing for doing things like this. <laughs> Um, personalizing content. So often, especially with B2B, for example, content can be, pre depending on your industry, right, it could be kind of dry. You go to a tool and say, help me make this more interesting, more engaging, or I want this tone to be a little bit more professional. Um, it'll help do that, right? It'll rewrite the content in the tone that you want. More motion, more pain points in the voice and tone of the brand. So I'm always asking it to do things to kind of play around. What's really interesting, um, this was from, a, uh, I was on a, a webinar a couple months ago, and the person who was training said, she put copy into the website and said, write this in the style of a woman. And, the, and, and so it like rewrote the copy to be like more flowery and more, more emotional and more friendlier. It was really interesting. I didn't do write this like I was a man, you know, but it's really interesting to play around with it and see what it comes up with. I know, right? It's very strange. And I think not, not really PC, but um, interesting. So again, it's just fun to play around with, especially if you are like, again, for, we've been creating content for years. Like I'm tired, right? Like how many, uh, how many times can you create content about, about pickleball? But things do change. You need to keep your content fresh, especially if it's content that's important to your business. And this really does help whether you're creating new content or improving existing content to keep it fresh and relevant because there's always new competitors who want to take our spots up at the top, right? This is really good for that. Adding stories and storytelling elements. I really like using these tools because storytelling is so important, right? Whether we're doing short form videos or writing articles, is saying here's a stat or here's a topic I'm writing about. Help me come up with a story about this, this, that leads to this outcome. And usually the story it creates is really not great, but it gives me a starting point. I really like, because again, adding stories is so important to copy, right? To keep our readers engaged. So it gives me a great starting point. Sometimes I'll refine it, sometimes I'll use it, and sometimes I won't. But again, I wouldn't have thought of it necessarily. Identifying FAQs, having frequently asked questions, Q&A in your copy is so important today. Tightening up your writing. If you know the writing is very like, long or blah or like meanders, ask it, make this more concise, make it more readable, help me make this, um, this article just um, uh, better for a more sophisticated reader. Whatever you wanna say, it really does tighten up writing really well. Repurposing content. I was just listening to a podcast who was, it was an agency owner who was saying, they, they do 20-80 when it comes to content. They spend 20% of their time writing content and 80% of the time promoting that content. 
on social media, getting someone to link to it, amplifying, getting it out there, repurposing it into a short form video. Um, they were saying they've done really well with that philosophy, right? Most people probably do the opposite or they spend 100% of their time creating copy. You can definitely flip it by using tools like this, but I love to copy and paste articles and say, okay, now help me create, um, create a LinkedIn um, article about this or help me create a real idea with this. And it does, it spits it out so nicely. So repurposing it for shareable social media content is great. And the other um, little tip is when you have content and it's okay, but you wanna keep it fresh, ask, what did I miss? Um, what did I miss about this? Usually I, I put that as the very last chat GPT prompt I do when I'm, when I'm doing a writing task. I say, is there anything else I missed? And it should usually give a couple of good ideas. So I really like it for that purpose. Um, write something better. So us um, SEOs, are, and, and maybe just not us, but very competitive, right? We're always trying to get to the top and outseat somebody who's already there. So what I like to do is um, one up my competitors. So I take a competitor's content or copy or article that's doing better than ours, and I'll copy and paste it to ChatGPT, and I'll say below is an article from a competitor I am pasting in as part one. I am next going to copy and paste my article as part two, because again, there's only so many characters you can copy and paste in. I said, after that, I'd like you to help analyze and make my article better than the competitor. Um, and again, why I love ChatGPT and these tools, because it's like, of course, I'll wait for you to copy and paste in your article. It, it's so polite. Like, I'm like, oh, I love using these tools. Again, um, and I, I still kind of like when we first had Alexa devices, I'm like, Alexa, can you please do this? You know, like, I still like, thank you so much. And it's like so polite. Like, I work by myself in my home office in like a little bat cave. It's just me. So I feel like it's like my little coworker friend who's so polite and does anything I want. It's wonderful. So I like to make my my content better than competitors, and this is definitely one of the ways that I do it, and it's super fun. Um, okay, next, we're shifting gears a little bit. Those are some of the ideas for SEO content tasks. What does Google say? Because at the end of the day, we don't want to have spent years and years working so hard to get our results up there and get rankings and get traffic for us to tank it using tools like this, right? What Google has said is that Generative AI is not enough to rank. And it's because of this specific concept and principle right here, EEAT, which is part of their algorithm and it's experience, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. AI lacks the E of experience. And this is kind of new. They've had the EAT, which was expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. What that is, is what they're saying is they want to rank sites that are experts, right? They don't want a spammy website just to get up to the top anymore. They, especially with content that's important, like around finances or bank loans or you know health, right, around COVID, they were like, we are going to rank really qualified websites that we know are the authority. We're not just gonna rank a Joe Schmo just because they have a really good SEO person. They want to rank experts today, right? They have to do their due diligence and make sure they're surfacing the right content. And this is any search engine, especially tools as we get into it like BARD and when AI is baked into these search engines, right? They cannot be putting content that they're not sure if is good or not at the top. So for a while now, they're saying we want experts to rank at the top, not just websites who have good SEO people. AI lacks the E of experience. And again, Google is working on ways to counter mass produced content because of course what's coming along with these tools is a flood of generic bad content. If we thought there was bad content out there before, like get ready because really bad content is out there now from people who are like, chat GPT, I can produce thousands of articles now. Um, and so Google has to combat that, right? So they need to be able to work against that to understand what is good AI content and what is bad AI content. They caution against publishing it as is without having a human editor review it before publishing. And I hope I don't have to say that. Like that's a given, right? Like we can't just take it and be like, great, here you go. That's why our jobs are not gonna be replaced, especially those of you who we do want leads. We are helping businesses grow, right? We're not just producing content for a content farm. Like we're doing business stuff here. Um, while Google has confirmed AI-generated content, it truly is okay as long as it's high quality, original, and useful. They've indicated that expertise and content based on real human experience will be rewarded with better visibility. So all that to say is 
Just because it's okay in Google's eyes does not mean they're automatically going to reward it with a position one ranking, right? It's gonna take more than that. And that's kind of goes back to the um, warm hug for your feet socks, right? Like that's good until 50,000 other websites are also saying that same thing. You still have to have unique content out there. So it's good and it's okay, but it's not good enough to rank you at the top. So just don't fool yourselves necessarily. So what Google has said, one of the ways they're trying to combat bad content, am I still okay, Bill? Yeah, okay, okay, um, is this new system that they rolled out called the Helpful Content System. So Google is always updating their algorithm. They've had so many updates in the past several months, right? They just had a spam update, they had a core out update, they had a helpful content update. It helps give them a signal using automated ranking systems, their AI, to ensure people are seeing original helpful content for people in the search results. They just launched an update and many sites like recipes and lifestyles saw significant drops um, because they probably were using tools like this, right? One of the things I wanna make sure I mention, so again, I think I'm preaching to the choir at this point. I've probably like beat the dead horse. Okay, we get it, move on. Um, helpful content does not mean more content. Don't just think, I've got a 500 word article. I gotta put it to like a 4,000 word and use these tools. That's not necessarily what helpful content is. Sometimes being helpful is shorter or better or more concise or um, saying, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna reference this other specific high authority website because that's in the best interest of you, right? So just keep that in mind. Helpful does not mean more. Just because you have more content doesn't necessarily mean it's going to rank better. Okay, EAT, how to get expert first-hand content. I wanted to make sure I left you guys with some takeaways about this because we know that they want expert content, um, have an opinion, take a stance, come to an informed conclusion, share the latest trends in context with your expertise, source material, SME, which is subject matter experts within your company or your website um, or your clients, interviews, feedback and chat logs from customer service team, feedback inboxes and sales calls from your sales team. If you are the expert in your business, get somebody to help pull out the information in your brain. You know, what I say right now, because I've done SEO for so long, it's hard for me to like talk about it on like a basic level. But if I had somebody interviewing me, I could talk about it all day long, but I would struggle. You know, if, so if you're the experts, have somebody interview you to get content out if you need it, if you have a hard time, you think getting to the right level your company reviews, other company reviews. I do all of these with my clients. Um, and I've got to tell you, the, the number one way I have gotten client content to rank at the top is interviewing the experts in their company. Really, there's just no other way. The marketer is usually not the expert. I'm certainly not the expert. Um, the people who are the experts get to them. Or if you need to partner with an influencer, because that person is the expert, interview the experts, right? because I wanted to give some examples of things that they say that someone who's not an expert wouldn't think of. So um, the first one is this, from an education, from one of my education clients, what they said in an article that, that I wrote because I interviewed them was, every teacher has experienced both giving up and sticking on the path to becoming an expert in something. The first time that this happened to me was as a third year science teacher. And he went into a little story about that. Um, so again, the more you can use language like this and you're using, um, observations is, is important. Only an expert would really be able to say that, right? Nutritionist, we had hired a nutritionist to create some recipes for one of my clients. And what she said in her content was, the key to making perfect pumpkin pecan pancakes, don't use old pumpkin pie spices. Spices lose their zing if they've been sitting in your cabinet for a while. And again, something like, oh yeah, like I would never, I, I've been using my pumpkin pie spice for like five, 10 years now. So I guess I was like, oh, well, that makes sense then. I'm not the expert. So again, experts know, I would never have used the word zing, right? And I don't know if ChatGPT would have as well. So the experts have little insights like this. We have to pull it out of them. This is the kind of content that ranks, right? A chef, and that's what that article is. I was watching the Today Show and there was this, um, chef from vegan soulicious and she was teaching the today show panel how to make curry and someone said well can you just use curry powder and she goes no she was like a curry is not a curry without fresh curry leaves and they're like what is a curry leaf and where do you get it right like so again people who are experts have opinions on things and you need to state that in your content um, there was, oh, someone else on the Today Show, because some people, it might be Good Morning America, I'm Today Show person. Um, they had another chef who was talking about buying fresh fish. 
and you have to like, you know, how you have to prepare it and cook it and make sure you don't get sick from it. And one of the Today Show um, anchors was like, well, can you freeze it? And he goes, why would you buy fresh fish just to freeze it? You know, like when you're, you know, again, that's an expert right there. And that's what you want to pull out. More storytelling, more specificity, more behind the scenes, more insider tips, more opinions. This is what Google wants, that extra E of experience. So using ChatGPT or Bard or Claude as a base and then using the expertise to help get you to the next level. So my um, suggestion is start a swipe folder. And for those of you who have maybe familiar with that, what that is is if you see a really well done email or an article or a blog post or a video, you kind of put it into what's called a swipe folder, which is, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a PC way to say this. It's where you almost like emulate your competitor. Like, this is amazing. I love this headline. Um, I'm going to make sure I use this or something almost just like it for my next email on the same topic, right? You're not copying and pasting. You're not just totally ripping them off. You're using what you've liked about what they've done as a source of inspiration. And so if you see content that's really well done in your space that has that like extra like, awesomeness about it, like those examples, put it into a swipe file, drag it over, put it in a Google Doc, have people in your company or your agency do that as well. Please don't copy and paste it and use it as is, use it as inspiration. Um, so <laughs> again, not trying to win a Pulitzer, just trying to be better than our competitors, more helpful to make our audience act and set us apart, um, interview experts, take responses, follow up prompts, all the things. Okay, I heard clapping and that other thing, so maybe I'm on time. Okay, all right, wrapping it up. Oh, wait, no. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> we still have a couple minutes, right? Okay, okay, wrapping up. Recap, originality is king, okay? Orig so we used to say content is king. Content is not king because we have ChatGPT. Content is now a commodity and has been for a while, right? Originality is king. Um, become a visible, recognized expert in your field. And that's not anything new. That's not like this huge revelation. We, we hopefully have been doing this um, for a couple years, but it's even more important than ever. Not all content is SEO content. Like, just like I say, not every page is an SEO page on your website. It's okay to write content without it being optimized for Google. You don't have to have a keyword. I know it's blasphemy for every page, right? Um, but like, if you need to write an email, if you are writing an internal document, like use ChatGPT and don't worry if it's duplicative or generic, right? I'm only saying you need to make it better if it's SEO content. So I use it to like craft emails all the time and do other copies. Social media, you don't necessarily need to worry. Go out there and say it's a warm hug for your feet. Like you don't need to worry as much. So not everything is SEO copy. I just want to make sure you guys know the difference of when you can copy and paste as is, we'll still use like some thought, but when you need to go to the next, uh, next level. ChatGPT does not have access to search volume, so it's an SEO starter, but it's not the end all be all, even though it's gonna be confident and thinks it does. Um, what does Google say? It's not enough to rank because of the EEAT, but it's a great starter. It's a great assistant for yourself. Um, have fun with these tools. There's so many plugins. I mean, I've been getting like, I go down the rabbit hole as well, but again, at the end of the day, know your purpose, get what you need to, and then get back out to what you need to be doing. Okay, and that's it. Um, I have a recap here if you guys want that free download. And that's it. Let's see. Good, good. Question time. Any questions? Oh, and thank you guys. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think you
Gosh, you know, I don't because what I don't understand necessarily, maybe someone does have that because is the purpose, like, because this is for like a, a resume and it's like a job thing, right? Like, I don't know what the prospective employer might want, like why it's, like what the purpose of that is, like why does it want you to use different words? So if there's a reason that it's looking, like if there's a specific job description and it wants you to make sure you're pulling out and using words from the job description that are a match. So I don't know the purpose on the other end. So I don't want to guide you in the wrong direction of why I'd be doing that because I don't really know. But it, please, anybody who has advice, go up after. Okay, yeah. If you use that as a trigger, as a suggestion, then you bring your human side to it and go evaluate what it says, like when you're looking for keywords, etc. Like it's like it's like a wingman, right? It's there, like, hey, you're using this a lot. And you're like, yes, I love design. Right? So, like, just because it's saying something there doesn't mean you can follow. It. I love that. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to design. And the second one was about the swiping. Oh As yeah. A designer, mm -hmm. I do that all the time. Yep. Anytime mm -hmm. I'm interacting with a site that I like, mm -hmm. I like what it's doing, I like what I'm seeing, I need that design inspiration. Mm -hmm. I take a screen capture and I put it in a file and I categorize it what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. It absolutely uh, you yes. Know, you make good design by the yeah. What did they say? There's no, no need oh. it's just undetected. Yes. Plagiarism. Yeah. I was gonna say no need to reinvent the wheel. Yes. That's good. Um, my, good. I think we have two minutes. Anybody else? So just a reminder, um, here's Jenny's contact information. Oh yeah, LinkedIn. Connect She's got me. a great e-newsletter. I subscribe oh, to sweet. it. I read it. I mean, we all get these e-newsletters. I read oh, yours. Oh, you're sweet. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I love my um, newsletter. Yeah, and just uh, connect. Um, anybody get some good notes, some good nuggets to take back and, oh, and play yeah. with? Yeah, that's, that's what we're here. And of course, we want more, right? So um, have conversations. One more time for one more question. Yeah, um, is there a link between uh, content and email campaigns? Oh. And uh, the content that you send them to on, on the site, and, and is, it, is there anything you can do with AI? Yeah. You know, um, Content for newsletters, I often tell people, like, if it's in a newsletter, like, it needs to be present on your website also, and it needs to be optimized. What may be a great email subject headline is not a great SEO headline necessarily, right? Because for emails, you want people to open the email and click on it. With SEO, you need a keyword. So you might be, like, getting more creative. And so you might tell ChatGPT, come up with some headlines for an email, and then on the same article, come up with some good SEO keyword um, SEO headings so you can compare the difference. Put them in a table so I can see the difference. I am always telling it, put it in a table so I can see side-by-side -side comparison. So what goes in the email should absolutely also go on the website in an optimized way. Um, so yeah, use AI to kind of help fashion it if needed. No, no, absolutely not. No, no, because Google, no search engine is crawling an email unless somehow your email service provider automatically uploaded it to your website. I don't think that's never I've seen it as an issue. So a scenario would be like, you have this need, and like the rest of us, we have those needs too, etc. You don't put the solution until you get to this page. That's different. That's if you want people instead of giving them the full content in your email, you want to like tease it and get them to click over to your website. That's kind of different. It just depends on do you want them to read the whole thing because people are mobile. They may you may lose them on the click and they may not read it. So that's almost like. A different thing like well which purpose if you want them to click over your website that's fine but that's not an SEO thing necessarily right, I just want content everywhere awesome. yeah thank you we can talk more about that later if we need to all right, all right thank you guys thank you, thank you both thank you guys